Hope you all of you are feeling good. Had a good lunch. My name is uh, Dr. Harinder Obroy. I'm writer Nifton Kundli, and I'm the moderator for this session. Just wanted to check the mics if they're working properly or not. They are good to go. And uh, how many of you actually uh, know something about fermentation? And I'm sure everybody knows about fermentation. If I need to ask you to raise your hands, I'll have all the hands up, isn't it? Yes, great. So fermentation is nothing new. And uh, the dahi we eat, the beer we drink, the tempeh we eat, you find fermentation everywhere. And sometimes it's natural fermentation, sometimes you add cultures to it to make yogurts. But if you have to make a dosa batter, you have natural fermentation also taking place. And in case if you talk about uh, the history of fermentation, I don't want to bore you with this. As such, post-lunch, it's difficult to keep people awake. I, I understand your limitations. Please bear with us. They should have kept a session before uh, lunch so that you feel a little hungry and you'll have a little more appetite to have more of the fermented products. But as it would be, we have to have at this point in time. It's a pretty old, uh, you know, if you look at its history, I think somewhere around 10,000 BC, wherein the Africans started uh, fermenting different the milk that they obtained from camel, goat, and then Chinese medicines, Chinese food drinks. But the actual flavor of fermentation came uh, when who is the person who is responsible or the scientist who is credited with starting the process of fermentation? Who is he? In the scientist who could be called as a father of fermentation. It's no one else other than Louis Pasteur. And everybody knows about the pasteurization process. It's because there was fermentation, it was because there was biological contamination, he thought of a process and that led to pasteurization. And the real hardcore you know, fermentations took place somewhere in 1900s and uh, wherein people started adding the culture, the starter cultures, what we talk, talk about. There was a Russian scientist, Evan Metcliffe, who again is, uh, is, uh, is a Nobel laureate and you know, has won various laurels for the work that he did with, uh, with the starter cultures. So the process went on. We've had uh, solid state fermentation. We had so much fermentation. We have... Uh, the, the ferment, uh, the, we also have the single cell protein and there were companies, there was a company called Industrial Chemicals in the US which is, who has started this process. So, and now from there, we have developed so many products, we have developed so many strains. The essence of fermentation is the use of microorganisms. Whether you culture them and use them or use the natural microflora and they, by virtue of being present in your gut, are as such colonizing your gut. We have a lot of, uh, if you look at your hands also, you have a lot of bacteria. And the beauty of uh, microbiology is, is that the microflora in one hand differs from the microflora in the other hand. Not only in terms of the quantity of uh, organisms that you have, but the different uh, genera and the species that we have. So uh, we're going to discuss a lot about it and I have very distinguished panelists here. We have uh, Dr. Sujata Jayaraman from HUL, who is uh, leading the, she is uh, country head for R&D, uh, Southeast Asia HUL, leading from the front as well as the food fermentation and the nutraceuticals, nutrition is concerned. Then we have Dr. Shampas Chahai. She's been uh, incubated with NIFTAM and she's doing a lot of work. She's a starter basically, who has done extensively well, having uh, put up the products on the shelf in uh, detail outlets in Delhi, Noida, Ghaziabad, and she's, she's trying to now move out of the Delhi NCR region as well by our efforts. And then we have Dr. Priya, she is uh, from uh, Danone, and again working in the area of uh, the health foods, the health benefits of the fermented foods. And then we have uh, Mr. Gopal, who's a freelancer who is projecting uh, the the, the concepts of fermentation, the concepts of food fortification to the world through his uh, marketing activities, through his promotional activities. He's from uh, Innova Marketing. So uh, without uh, you know, 
much ado, let me get started with this. Uh, if there's anything I would want, because we have very fewer uh, people on the board. So we, we need to make it more interactive. And if any of you didn't have a cup of tea, you can just go out and have a cup of tea and come back so that you're awake for the session. And uh, so uh, we'll get started with the discussions, and I would want that we should have some interaction also. We'll have more time for interaction in the end. We are going to keep our session pretty small, pretty short. Right? So this, with this, let me, uh, it's working. Am I audible? Yeah. Oh, good, it's working. Sometimes one works, the other doesn't work, so that puts in a fix. Uh, let me start with Dr. Priya. I did touch about, I did talk about uh, the fermented foods. But now the realization about fermented foods doesn't seem to be very substantial. In the sense, people enjoy fermented foods, right? North Indians love uh, dosa idli, right? And uh, South Indians love uh, tempeh and uh, sofu. We all love yakult and yogurts. But then what are the actual true benefits that are being derived out of this health food, the fermented foods? Just your insights in this one. Thank, thank you, Dr. Harinder, and a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, okay, I, I'm going to make this interactive first. How many of you have heard of having rice soaked in water the previous night and, you know, drinking that water and rice? So this was like our South Indian staple food, right? And uh, how many of you are fond of pickles? That's nice to know. Uh, the origin of these foods, basically, today when we talk about the gut-brain axis. So gut is the new brain. Our stomach is our new brain today. If the gut is unhealthy, your brain doesn't function. With the increasing lifestyle disorders, especially of the triple burden of nutrition that our country is facing, um, I'm sure all of us in this room today have late night dinners, high calorie dinners, midnight um, deserts, which is actually impairing our gut. And in, in turn, what do we see? Obesity, increased waist hip ratio, increase in diabetes. Now, while we say these eating habits only proliferate outside the body as these metabolic disorders, internally, they are really damaging our gut which means you don't have to have an autoimmune, like your diabetes is an autoimmune disorder or obesity is not just a hereditary and family. Today, the most critical aspect is having healthy food, having traditional old foods. While I'm sure there are a lot of products out in the market and we have startups here who talk about adding probiotic, prebiotic to the food. Anyone in the audience who can tell me what is a probiotic? How many of you have had probiotic shots, maybe adding powder to water? I mean, I see so many. I'm, I'm also on social media. You all have seen? No, nobody has had probiotic. Nobody knows what is probiotic. Sorry, they're live organisms. So what we eat is prebiotic food, which kind of helps the good microbiota to grow in our stomach, which act as probiotic. This helps in digestion. So Adahi and when sir talked about idli, dosas, the doklas of Gujarat, or the traditional South Indian, you know, rice soaked in water, all these are help the good, serve as food for the good microorganisms to grow in the gut. This not only keeps our gut healthy, but every time you have a healthy meal, or you have some amount of, um, you know, your comfort food, which is normally curd rice, anything that is fermented, you normally are very active on your brain. You are more alert. Uh, you also are able to uh, have a good gut microbiota to have a defense mechanism towards multiple metabolic disorders. Yeah. Uh, just to add on to what she said, if you split these two words, Prebiotic and probiotic. Pre plus bios. Bios is anybody? Bios. Life, exactly. So something that gives a stimulus to life. It's a prebiotic. It could be inulin, it could be other fibers, it could be vegetables. So anything which is good for the probiotic. And probiotic is for life. 
So there is a probiotic which requires a prebiotic as uh, Dr. Priya talked about. The interaction of prebiotic and probiotic makes it a symbiotic. So, uh, you know, we talk about the gut microbiome, but before that I feel, you know, that Indian traditional foods and uh, taking the Indian fermented traditional foods to the market has been a challenge. I'd like to ask Gopal, like, what could be the better strategies? We have, you know, I, I, we, we, we see examples of ID. You know, they have really captured the market. They started from Bangalore, they are all in South India, and now they've come to North India also. And uh, they've devised a strategy because the shelf life of the batters is very, very low. But somehow, they've been able to put up their products in the marketplace in a very, very efficient manner. So since you are uh, the person who knows about the strategies, for putting the products in the market. What has been their USP or what do you suggest could be done more of putting the fermented products, which like Dr. Priya said, are Dhoklas and the Idlis, of course, now Idli, Murugan Idli is, it's you know, uh, becoming an international brand. And dosas as such are, we, we end up paying about 250 rupees for a dosa in uh, North India, Sagar Ratna and all. But then if you have to put, uh, you know, those traditional fermented foods in Indian market, international market, what could be the better strategies? See, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harinder. Once again, um, I would like to start from what uh, Dr. Priya as well mentioned. So one thing being uh, a market researcher as a base, for years I've been understanding uh, from a life science background and also from the market research perspective. So one from the base we have to understand the for example, the benefits. So anything that was something that what I, every uh, place that I go, like uh, for example, last uh, month as well, I was moderating a session, creating a winning product. So that was a that was a title. From there, I also say like it's not only creating a winning product, but creating a winning product it depends on the consumers. Then the consumers how they take, and there should be a value proposition as well. So when we come about the strategy point. So it's always you target the consumers and when they pay money and get something and they put into the system, it's always there should be a reasoning why I am consuming this product. No longer like whenever when we speak about the trends of like even indulgence becoming more healthy now. So indulgence with health. And with that, people are also more and more looking at that is the value proposition. Why am I consuming this product? for which we are only now going to the roots of the tradition. So the traditional foods, like I remember like still I, I worked something with Niftam a few years ago on traditional processed functional foods. So there as well we are only going back to the old technologies and then we are coming up, but more importantly the strategy comes primarily on the positioning of the products the value benefits. So these are the benefits that I'm going to give. And now increasing awareness, the consumer awareness, they are not even, not just looking at the product or aesthetics of the product. Now consumers are more becoming aware that they should look at what ingredient am I consuming? How many ingredients are there? What is the value that I'm getting? Is it like, like increase in fiber, increasing protein, low in sugar, no added sugars, etc., etc. These are the things now, when I say about fermentation actually, so if I may remember in the last um, five years, if I see, at least I would say 30% of new products launched in the world, 30% of the products, of all the FNB products launched, 30% of products has on the front of pack and the back of pack, they have fermentation related claims of which Overall, even in India, if I may recall, 21% growth has been seen in Indian product products launched in India, all the major companies. And people are also only going back, like I said, going back to the roots, trying to figure out how I can support the health benefits, like people say, like immune boosting, like people say. And gut health is something more focused. Post-pandemic, people are not, one is like the immune boosting, the other one again even immune boosting as well, fermentation plays a major role, some of the products been 
very much produced and focused on that to primarily the gut health. And when we are mentioning like, again, that's why people promote more and more how the value is going to, de the, the delivery, the value deliver is going to be delivered to your system. This is where one, strategy wise, when we say how to reach out, one, technology wise, first priority is convince the consumers, never confuse the consumers. This is even more important. And then go with the strategy, thanks to the technologies. So technology is how our scientists have done a lot of work. And then like when you said the single cell protein technology, and then like now more and more precision fermentation technology is something that what not many people know what is precision fermentation technology. Anyone know the, the difference between a traditional fermentation and precision fermentation? Just one difference. Anyone? Pardon me? Control fermentation. Con controlled. And precisely you can say what I want, what I, the targeted. Precisely like I want, for example, I want to produce inulin, for example, sorry, insulin. Or maybe I wanted to focus on very specific ingredient that more and more ingredient companies are focusing on that. Okay, that is something like, again, taking advantage of the technology in front. Okay, this is something that I would say consumers, to summarize, consumers focus, uh, like focus more on the health benefits and then focus on the uh, use, make use of the uh, technology and advancements as well. Those are the two things that I think all the companies should going for, they should focus. Yeah, well said. Uh, with the, so many panelists from uh, multinational companies, they would understand better than me that consumer is the king today. Because they've given so many wider options to the consumer. So he is the one who picks and chooses things. And who would know better than Dr. Shampar Sahai about it? What is said, I mean, how are you really targeting? What are the kind of problems that you're facing? One is from upscaling the process, the technological interventions that you need, and again, convincing the consumers. Is it really easy or difficult to convince a consumer or set of consumers to take, to, you know, purchase, to buy your products? Thank you, sir. Uh, for me, it's like a scale up of a product or maybe a startup. It's like dream versus reality. When we think about a, a startup, we actually don't know what the challenges are going to come. And a co-founder is having only dream and uh, that passion that he or she is going to execute. But what they don't have, no team, no uh, facility for uh, like equipments and all, no market knowledge as such if uh, the person is not technically sound in the market. So nothing is in hand, but when you reach to the customer or maybe the market, the competition is same. I mean, the produ product should be world class. You don't have any infra, but the product and the competition is same. So this journey is not at all an easy journey. And uh, it starts uh, uh, from very st uh, early stage, like uh, product optimization stage. Even at that stage also the problem comes. Because you don't have any team. You have planned for something. You have planned a recipe. But how to make that? How to optimize your process? Fermentation processes are like it uh, deals with the live organisms. So very small mistake can uh, make disasters. Now if you have optimized your things, now the comes, uh, next comes the scaling up. Now how to do the scale up things? Because for scaling up you need uh, equipment, uh, you need, uh, need uh, uh, fermenters and uh, everything. For small batches, again it's easy to handle because many things can be done in a small batches. Uh, results often come very nice. But once you go for translating it from on the higher side, like big vessels, big fermenter you're going to use, significantly results changes. And as these are very much in, in, environmental uh, dependent things, a small change in temperature, a small oxygen change may sometimes create uh, contamination, maybe product quality may change. And being a startup, we actually don't have access to automatic machines and all because we can't afford that. So definitely we need to work with a very medium type of machine where no automation is there, nothing is there. So you are very much dependent on the uh, labors and manpower. So if you are dependent on manpower, that means it is going to be a time intensive as well as labor intensive process. That means your uh, operation cost anyhow increases. 
because it's now dependent on human beings and that too you are not uh, able to afford skilled manpower sometimes because they charge high so you are dependent on sometimes unskilled manpower and they are going to work for you so human chances of human error uh, human errors also increases and these things practically we often face uh, in our uh, units it's a these are very common challenges that we face so now uh, if uh, uh, you overcome all these things then comes the raw material thing you are not going to get a very good raw material consistently because you have very less moqs big vendors will not entertain you that means how to get the raw material consistently whole the year and definitely if it is seasonal uh, raw materials or maybe sensitive raw material then the problem increases so uh, now you have you are dependent on small vendors same they may stop your uh, uh, like uh, sometimes they say no madam we can't give it to you or sometimes these things happens regularly but they will increase your raw material cost but you can't increase your cost of the product last mile you can't do the things but your raw material cost has been increased so these things we often face and uh, uh these things compromises the quality also because again we don't have that uh, strong quality mes uh, measures with us we don't have that team who can maintain uh, at least for the early stages now after some times that startup is set up then things becomes easier but initially at initial stage we actually don't have any quality check team we don't have hasps how to develop those hasps who will develop it for you and if at all you are developing it how to execute it each and every process of hasp needs cost so whether you will go for raw material whether you will go for equipments or you will go for the hasp things i mean where to go so these are the practical things during the scale up stage now comes the market market is again uh, very challenging because once you reach to the market competition uh, is there for any product competition is there so you as a startup you don't have uh, money to uh, give to the uh, to the shops nowadays people are asking for listing charges people are asking for uh, huge margins that uh, profit uh, level that significantly reduces for big houses these are not at all a challenge they have a team they can manage their um, like uh, sir said they they are working only for the market but as a startup we don't have these facilities where to hire this person i mean who will work for us we are not able to give money to the uh, uh, retailers that margin they they ask margin is okay but listing charge if they are asking just say 1 lakh for a shop that means in 10 shops it's going to be 10 lakhs how to afford those things i think we'll ask gopal later on like how to help you out with this <laughs> because <laughs> the problems that appear to be too many now but then we have uh, i think it's very important i'm sure gopal would agree with me is that whenever you venture into a business you should know what you are going to do and how you are going to do if you entering into a market which requires lot of scientific interventions obviously you have to have your thought process pretty clear and the road map ahead has to be clearly laid down because uh when you talk about fermentation at the same time you know you have to maintain those conditions the optimal conditions the aseptic conditions to take things forward but then there is a company uh, you know which has been working in the fermentation space has done a, it's a big multinational we have in that's hul like to know from dr sujata like what do you think are you know how to sustain the technologies that we have the technological intervention we are doing a lot of technological interventions HUL is known for you have wonderful R&D center and each year you are filing so many patents and uh, you are uh, uh, internationally also you are well recognized uh, R&D if you have well recognized established R&D setups so how do you think we can sustain uh, because the, the sustainability is something which is a very key word now it's a it's a buzz word and how to ensure that technologies also can sustain for pretty longer period thank you uh, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to be part of this uh, fermentation panel uh, but first thing i think all of you we all kept talking about idlis dosas and pickle but the what is the first thing that come to your mind when you think of these foods it's taste right more than health i think that's a beauty that's why i love the fermentation technology 
it's a technology that primarily doesn't compromise on taste, but also it's healthy. So, so with that note, uh, before I, I uh, go into answering the specific question that uh, 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 Dr. O'Brien asked about how to sustain technologies, I take a step back uh, about uh, the, what do we learn from the ancient wisdom of fermentation. So there are two big things everybody spoke about. Uh, it's about uh, the, uh, the health benefits that we get because of the, the probiotics that are there which improves gut health. But something as a, you know, you know, being in the, the foods and beverages uh, business for nearly 20 years, uh, there is something very big that we learned from fermentation technologies. It is about natural preservation. If you take salt or any of the fermented foods that you, uh, uh, in the, our, uh, uh, from a tradition, if you look at, they are done not only, it, it's done primarily for preservation as well. The shelf life increases for once you have uh, a pickle, it, it's a shelf life of more than a year to sometimes it's also two years. So that is the biggest thing. So how, how are we, how, how is the, where is the preservation coming from? So it's the bacteria, they primarily produce molecules like uh, ethanol uh, or acetic acid, which are acting as natural uh, preservation agents. So this is the, what in Unilever or in HL, how we look at, uh, what we learn from these technologies is, how do we use this traditional wisdom and apply the modern science to be able to use the uh, natural preservation technologies to our products. So this is one of the big area that we work, and this is for the current. And if, if we now give you some examples of uh, some of this, uh, we work a lot on beverages. So you might be, be hearing about the Brook Pond as a brand. Kombucha is one of the uh, extremely well-known, um, the fermented beverage. Uh, it's uh, primarily, you add sugar to ferment, but then the sugars are all converted, so it's actually, uh, a beverage which is uh, sweet but doesn't have the sugar uh, because they are all already converted into uh, a, a more than a trisaccharide, so it, it becomes a fiber. And this are this is an excellent source of uh, probiotics, so it's really good for improving the gut health. So that's we have products under Lipton uh, in in our global markets, uh, extremely tasty in various different flavors, and that's one of the fermented product. And then if we now look at uh, the, uh, uh, in Marmite, uh, it's one of the product, we don't have it in India, but countries like Sri Lanka, it's again, the flavors there are uh, primarily the fermented flavors. But one of the big examples is the soy sauce, uh, where it is the, both the, the taste, the entire process, and the, uh, uh, that's by the fermentation technology. Uh, we call the, some of the technologies that, uh, how do we create the patents or, how do we keep it sustainable? Uh, and some of our pa previous panelists spoke about in a product, uh, your winning product need to have both uh, taste. Consumers will never compromise taste for health. And fermentation technologies try to help in enhancing taste in addition to the health benefit, especially in soy. Uh, they help us in uh, having very specific strains which can help in boosting the umami note. Uh, which is what the soy is used as a, as a cooking aid in multiple foods. And also, it, there are some of the strains which we use which help in uh, the reducing the off notes, which many people don't like, especially in, our, in Indian food. So these are, again, how do you tailor the taste to the consumer uh, preference is also something we can do by right choice of strains and uh, uh, by the, the process technologies will be, a, a, we primarily, that's what we use, and uh, some of them are also our proprietary technologies. Now coming to the, the, the question about uh, the, uh, uh, I think I should touch the, the, proprietary, uh, the sustainability. Now one is about using the traditional wisdom and how to use natural preservation. This is a big thing now, because consumers are more and more looking for uh, no preservatives, especially uh, moms are looking at every product if it is a with preserv uh, is there a no preservative claim over there this is something everybody is looking for and that's that's where fermentation technologies play a very big role either it is in situ fermentation where you create the the natural uh, pre uh, preservative agents and increase shelf life or we can also do externally and add like a, a fermented vinegar 
in our uh, mayonnaise we add so that that becomes a natural preservative agent that we are adding back. But now where is the future? The future is about the, the precision fermentation that we spoke about, uh, the previous panelists touched upon. Uh, what uh, there are two elements we are looking at. One is, uh, all of you might know, uh, everywhere when we talk about our net zero target, one of our big thing is um, the uh, alternate uh, meat, especially plant to combat the climate uh, uh, change that we are targeting then it is very important we have alternate protein sources that come with lower carbon footprint. This is where we are, the, when we talk about the precision um, uh, fermentation, specifically we are looking at, at least at Unilever from a context of uh, the non-meat uh, proteins, especially we have a brand called Vegetarian Butcher, and uh, this is a burger brand, and uh, we are, and it, burger is normally with meat. So we are primarily looking at how do we get alternate the uh, uh, proteins, plant-derived proteins that can replace, but give the same texture like the, 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 uh, the animal-derived proteins. So this is uh, the, uh, although there are multiple process technologies that are available, one of the, uh, the next generation technology is precision fermentation with which we'll be able to lab culture create proteins with the required specification, especially on the chewability uh, and uh, the solubility and processability, because this is the biggest challenge. And you cannot simply take a soy or pea protein and uh, try to match the properties of a meat protein. And this is where the fermentation comes very, very handy. How to alter the properties that can really match with the taste and texture of a, uh, a alternate uh, meat. And also alternate dairy. Uh, we have worked with some of the companies like uh, Perfect Day and uh, lab cult cultured uh, the, the non-dairy proteins we have used in our ice cream under Breyer's brand launched in US. Uh, so we also look at this uh, next generation technologies to get uh, sustainable proteins. Now, the, uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I maybe pass here, there are also when we talk about these next generation technologies, alternate materials, there, are, there is a lot about how to assure their food safety and how to assure their, uh, the, uh, how to, uh, are there regula regulatory allowed in every country. These are all the challenges. Maybe we'll touch upon in the next round. Yeah, I mean, very comprehensively covered everything. Uh, when, I mean, I think going back to the, the wisdom, the, the ancient wisdom that we have, the traditional wisdom that we have, I think there are a lot of products, the, the, the way you talked about, you know, just add uh, salt to the cabbage leaves and where you get sauerkraut out of it. And the olives, when they put in the salt solution, there's a fermentation that takes place. And uh, let me, uh, any of you know, what are the other benefits of fermentation? If you talk about the benefits of fermentation, what are these? What will happen if I have, like you, she talked about rice water, Nutrient content increases, that's number one. Number two, do you think that digestibility also increases? Yeah. Why are uh, dosas and idlis very easily digestible compared to makke ki roti or uh, the, the roti made from wheat? So you all agree with it. Do by any chance, do you think that's, uh, that triggers our palate also? Fermented foods, do they trigger our palate? When you eat, uh, when you consume sauerkraut, if you have gherkins, do you love to eat gherkins or olives when they are... Uh, in a solution? Yeah, okay, good. So all of you agree with me on this, and how about curd? All of you eat curd? So do you wish to, you know, uh, and you make lassi out of the curd, and you, you know, really relish that? So all that fermentation, that is what, again, so in fermentation, uh, it's not only the breakdown of complex molecules that takes place, there's these microorganisms, these bacteria and these fungi, which are responsible for fermentation, also produce a lot of enzymes, which help in breaking down these complex polysaccharides, complex proteins. Because some of the proteins are not easily digestible. But if you have a protein source and if you have micro microbial fermentation system well in place, I think then it combines well and you get good digestion from it and you enjoy the food as well. Uh, Dr. Priya, what have been the other challenges in fermentation? Like, you know, we, we do see that uh, 
everybody here is enjoying fermented fruits. I mean, they, they know that it increases the palatability, it increases the digestibility, they love to eat fermented food. But what are the challenges that an industry faces in logistics, of transporting uh, fermented products, or uh, the shelf life issues? So what do you think, you know, what are your insights on this? Sure. Um, just like when we make an idli dosa batter, the life of it is one week in the house maximum, right? Similarly, when um, Dr. Sujata spoke on the precision and you know developing these strains, um, all these are done at certain temperatures, right? So hence, maintaining the temperatures of ambience to ensure that these strains, when exposed to extreme temperatures, may be sustained in the gut or may not be. Our stomach contains hydrochloric acid and there is a pH balance that needs to be maintained. Also, when, when you talk about maintenance of these microorganisms, or growth of these microorganisms also happens at a certain temperature in the stomach or certain conditions in the stomach. Similarly, when we talk about external food products, so the packaging here comes into play or protecting these microorganisms in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a particular count that will be able to give you the health benefit is very critical. If you look at the FSCI guidelines, when probiotics or prebiotics, or when you pick up any packs and say contains probiotics, there are specifications given by the regulations that if you want to retain this claim, there is a certain amount of this microbial count that has to be there throughout the shelf life period of the product. And hence, shelf life studies become very, very critical, especially for these, um, I would say, very, um, uh, very critical strains. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Sujata can add more on how the shelf life studies can be enhanced, etc. But definitely, there are certain conditions certain microbial count that needs to be maintained and sustained in the product throughout the availability of product on the shelf. If you want to add. The, uh, uh, so thank you. I think that's uh, one of the, uh, on the one hand, uh, it's a uh, irony, right? Uh, we say we actually increase the food safety by uh, sterilization where to kill microbes and then if you are now all now telling you add microbes and give it to the consumer I'm sure um, you all might be thinking oh is it really safe so uh, some of the technologies that we apply to ensure that uh, they are it doesn't doesn't grow to an unlimited level and it's a burst of microbes when you open and that also comes out if it if you don't control it the, the, the pack swell because of the CO2 that is getting liberated and you have to throw the pack, it bursts open and it is no longer edible. So some of the technologies that we apply is encapsulate these and, and they become uh, the sterile when they are in the pack, uh, they don't multiply. And then when they are, uh, uh, after we consume, in the gut pH, they become active. I think that is the kind of technologies that we apply so that uh, these uh, uh, probiotic strains can be delivered to the consumers with a required shelf life and also with, uh, um, without losing their activity and the benefits. Uh, I'll just add on to what uh, Dr. Sujata talked about. Uh, if you go to a chemist shop, I mean, especially when the kids have uh, dysentery and diarrhea, doctors normally prescribe something called Econom. I'm sure you must have heard about it. It's nothing but a probiotic. It's a Saccharomyces boulevardii cells. You have minimum one billion cells there. They're all encapsulated. They are in, they are in a powder form. It's enca 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 encapsulated, and the moment you gulp in, in, within no time, because of pH differential, they get released into the uh, into our intestine. So uh, we at Niftum also have developed a lot of these technologies, which are basically uh, in fact, one of our scientists is working, and Dr. Sujata knows about it. We have strains which are able to produce vitamin uh, B2, B1, B2, B12, and uh, those, and what we've done actually is, like, we have taken uh, mushroom, we expose mushroom to ultraviolet radiations, because mushrooms contain ergosterol, so ergosterol gets converted into colcalciferol, that is a vitamin D, through uh, UV radiations, and then we have fermented that floor using a probiotic culture. 
So you've got the enhanced benefits of B1, B2, B12 along with vitamin D and that. If you add that to any of the ATAs, that becomes a fortified ATA. And as such, you know, the probiotic sachet which are, are there. And, uh, uh, but the only problem that I'm seeing Dr. Sujata now is if, uh, if I have to give somebody a normal sachet of probiotic, for example, the one uh, you saw at uh, Niftum. Now, if I don't claim it as a probiotic, then, then it's fine. Then it can go into the uh, nutraceutical category, saying that, okay, fine, it's giving some effect. It has some positive effect. But from the regulatory framework, I think there is now a tussle going on between uh, FSSA and Sedesco as far as who would take the probiotics into the regulatory mode. Should it be controlled by uh, FSSAI or it should go to Sedesco? I would just want, I mean, I, we are not going to touch about the regulations here. We are not going to talk about the government policies, other things. I would request you for your honest opinion on that. Like probiotics, do you think they should remain with the FSSAI or they should be shifted down to Sedisco? The, uh, I think the answer, uh, uh, the way I would approach this in answering, there is no straight answer, right? <laughs> so we have to apply some logical thinking over here. So now it depends on the application. For example, if the probiotic is not at a, a neutraceutical level, it's going to solve a problem, but it is more as enhancing the benefit. It is a, a food plus where I'm already delivering a fiber uh, in my product and then the probiotic is a, a hybrid pre and probiotic together which on an everyday you consume and then it sort of helps in preventing or enhancing some benefits then it falls under foods it's a food product that is really delivering the benefit but if it is a, a probiotic which is actually like uh, 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 some of the startups who are only selling a sachet of probiotic it is not part of any food it is actually culture sold as sachets, which you can take, you can add to water, you are enhancing uh, the gut health because of everyday consumption. And then you are not going to see the benefit in a day. The benefit is going to come over time because it is an everyday consumption. It's more a maintenance than curative, then it is definitely FSSAI. But if it is more curative for a specific uh, health conditions, then it doesn't fall under standard food, then it of course, there can't be a standard answer to this question. But then, uh, well said. Uh, but then there is, again, a very thin line between the two uh, to work on. Uh, Dr. Shampa, what are the kind of regulatory challenges that you're facing? I mean, are you comfortable in uh, selling the fermented products that you're doing? Are there any the challenges that you're facing from the regulatory perspective? Do you think that there should be separate guidelines for fermented products which will facilitate their... Uh, uh, their uh, easy marketability or there should be something through which uh, you would like some kind of solace or help from uh, the regulator? Uh, for regulatory point of view, I would like to say that uh, regulations are clear. If that understanding should be there, for the startups that understanding problem may be there, but actually regulations are clear. Uh, it's not that much of that much complicated, but if you work for anything novel, then it becomes little difficult to get that, those approvals and all. So at that uh, point of time, we get some problem. But for general regulations, things are clear. And uh, the important is the knowledge. That, uh, that thing should be there, that understanding should be there. And one thing that happens, uh, like sometimes the amendments are very uh, frequent with the, these regulations. So those re uh, some amendments are coming and if they, uh, those things are not coming to the scale up or maybe somehow scale up uh, is not knowing that so problem comes in the market like um, uh, they ask for the licensing like ma manufacturing you are a manufacturer but you are not a wholesaler type of things that comes often which is uh, i believe the things are there regulations are there but that understanding should be with the uh, founder co-founder he or she should know the rules and regulations, then the regulations are not that complicated as such. You talked about, you know, I think now FSSA, you know, being a former advisor of FSSA, a lot of changes have taken place as far as the, the FOSCO system is concerned, through which you take license, or even the product approval system, the EPA system that we had created while I was there. So, uh, 
you know, things have uh, eased out. There have been a lot of simplification. But uh, Gopal, the, the process of new product approvals, now that is, uh, I'm sure you know about it, that's a pretty long process. If we have to, especially the non-specified foods, if any food that has been imported which is non-specified, the ingredients are not known in the country or they do not fall under the FSSR, the regulations. And uh, since you would have uh, talked, you would have seen the, the, these kind of new product approvals in other countries also with other regulators too. How do you compare them with the Indian uh, system of approvals? Do you think it's too complex or we need to, uh, to uh, re reduce certain steps to make it more simplified so that more startups can come in and we, in fact, we encourage uh, creativity rather than discouraging it. Because if a product approval takes about a year or so, the very purpose, the, the very flavor behind it gets lost. So what do you think like, when you, when you uh, raise these kind of concerns, issues with the, with the food manufacturers? I'm sure you must have come across all these issues. Yeah, uh, being from the, the market uh, perspective, so yes, I do uh, encounter, I have encountered people coming to us and then saying that, hey, you know what, can you please help us with this? Though we are, we as a company help on the strategy level. So like how you can uh, make choices, make informed business decisions with respect to being the, how to choose the claims that the right claims are being used. And because again, one thing that I have to, sadly we have to agree to it. In India, compared to your European EFSA or US FDA, so India has always been not that stringent. So we have been more, more and more flexible that's one of the like reasons, if you can say that FSSA is now being more st stringent with respect to even the recent ones that what we have seen, like people are not supposed to call, like for example, if it is not a meat, okay, so if it is not a meat, you are not supposed to e uh, use the word meat and even a milk, the syllable you cannot use, the, the pronunciation cannot be like milk, like plant milk, you cannot say that. And someone said like, instead of M-I-L-K, I'll put M-Y-L-K, still companies like and the, and the independent people, they said like, we will uh, file a case against you. And then they have to, one good I get, one good or one dot. So in Bangalore based company, they have to go around all these things. To answer the question, yes, there are a lot of challenges. And if you ask me, should we uh, be, should FSSA being a little, a little bit of liberal and then giving the approvals, etc. I would still say it's now, it's just now, it is just now that to emphasize that FSSA is getting more and more stringent in the process because the global markets, like when a product is exported from Europe or in other stringent countries, okay, where the law is very strict, especially the food and pharma laws, because these are food and pharma is the two things that goes inside the system instead of like just using outside the body. Okay, so it is very strict, but we always had this regulations not in place or maybe the more flexible way. So now if you ask me that if should the FSSA or be any authority be a little bit of kind enough to just free it and then say that no, I would say still we are not even there. We are the very early stage of applying the stringent processes where we are now we are stopping people like we are not supposed to claim as real fruit, 100% uh, fruit, juice, coconut, 100% coconut water, nothing. Nothing is there. Now every single company that I am facing now when we see that and uh, my customers as well, my clients and the, uh, and the companies, I see more of the most of the shelves. If I go to a big supermarket, I see most of the products are being recalled because the time deadline is more and more approaching. You're not supposed, you have to completely change your claims and you, are, you, you do not have the right to cheat the or like mis, uh, mislead the consumers that this is 100% juice. This is 100% uh, concentrate, 100% natural. No, it is not. Everyone knows that. So, Coming back to the point, again, we should be more and more stringent. It's not about we supporting the startups because it's not the case. It's not, I'm not saying we are not supposed to start because the startups work even more than the established brands because they want to ensure my ro there are no roadblocks for my success. And they are already following stringent uh, measures to ensure to comply the FSSA regulations. Here, the only thing is, at the end of the day, you and me as well, and all the panelists and the audience here, we are all consumers at the end of the day. We should only say that what is right 
if i am convinced and again the value that i'm going to bring you be it honest and then if the value is convinced then i buy the product and i put it into my system otherwise not so i would only go on the other side and say we should implement more stringent regulations with existing products as well as the upcoming products as well and that is e very important not for us now and even for the upcoming generations as well what now even now we are only picking up the roots and the traditional process and methodologies and the products now come making it into more and more process not process but bringing into the commercial world that's what we are trying to do now anyway i don't think that would please the dr champa more than uh, she can think of if i could uh, uh, add on to this <clears throat> so currently a uh, i think at least with respect to fermented foods if we have to make a health claim the most difficult part is to generate evidence today fssi regulation says and when make when you make claims like this is going to enhance your gut how does one really measure that however science is advanced and today you have stool checkers and you have companies who talk about i can tell you what your microbiota is looking at your stool sample so this is where science is advancing and this aspect is helping build claims on products so while it is getting stringent yes and if you look at efsa claims there is a list of claims of what nutrient you can correlate to what health benefit similarly in india science is advancing and he was right in saying that we are getting stringent but yes when you make a health claim you have to be right you have to have appropriate evidence and scientific clinical trials to be able to prove the benefit and it has to be well validated before you put it on a pack to uh, where consumers are just going to not look at what is the strain is it uh, you know in that 10 raised to xx uh, unit what are they going to read oh my gut is going to become healthy hence translating this science with clinical evidence as a responsible industry is is on that responsibility lies on the industry today i i just thought i'll i'll build on uh, over here i think the the regulations for um, how to claim and also uh, what are the sub claim substantiations required especially with respect to health claims are very stringent and there are very very uh, clear Uh, uh policies uh, regulating this and uh, i think with respect to the topic we are ta uh, talking about fermentation technologies and uh, uh, the uh, the benefits related to pro and prebiotics if it is related to uh, the gut health the science on microbiomics has exploded now than what it was um, yeah, yeah, even 5 years back and also like in covid the pcr which was a very very expensive test now everybody can do within a day you get a pcr done and it is so affordable likewise the microbiome profiling um, either with the stool or the gut health markers are extremely well established something i would like to share is uh, some of the uh, the team members are here who are from clinical uh, group and with for our diabetes horlicks where we are using Uh, fibers as a prebiotics we have done clinicals and created evidence using um, gut health marker which are short chain fatty acids and uh, this is in a in a clinical we have shown whether the the marker molecule the short chain fatty acids are enhanced because of the intervention and this now of course whenever you do a clinical there is a thorough uh, like a uh, 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 evaluation of the design and also the clinical study need to get published and peer reviewed and when it is peer reviewed and getting published then the science is validated only then the claim can even come to the the front of pack after uh, of course uh, the claim committee is reviewing it but there are uh, a very well established scientific ways by which the benefits can be substantiated clinically i think that's all the more important because uh, we should not really you know go over the things or overboard or overclaim certain things which are actually not possible that is what we have seen in the past when i was refsc also they are company claiming things which are actually not can this can't be imagined also i totally agree with all of you here that uh, especially for startups because i would like to see many of my students transforming into startups and the startups who are working over there in the audience here 
please be very specific with the claims. And there's a claims committee in FSCI who looks into all this. So if you are going, you know, going uh, gung ho with the claims, and actually your product doesn't uh, have those ingredients, obviously you will be prosecuted for that. And then, you know, we have models as uh, both uh, Dr. Priya and Dr. Sujara talked about. We have the in vitro digestibility models. And I would, in fact, go a step further, like, you know, like the research organizations like ours would like to even have a shine system, wherein you have, you, know, you have the fermenters lined up in a row with different pH, and which is actually imitating the, 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 the total gut. And through which, I think that will really help us in establishing or substantiating the clinical studies too. So that is important because that's a patented technology by one of the universities in uh, Ghent University in Belgium. So it's a little expensive, but I think that is going to be the need of an hour if you if we just move on with the, the probiotics. Uh, uh, Dr. Priya, like, you know, uh, we talked about probiotics. You started, uh, you the first sentence, what she spoke was about, my favorite sentence is from belly to brain. Talked about that. So what do you think are the novel interventions that are required in this system to see that uh, we have the strains with us, the probiotic strains, which are actually helping us in improving uh, the, the neural network that we have. I'm not talking about the artificial neural network, the, the natural neural network that we have here. OK. So if I have to, um, just putting my thoughts together, if I have to say, what are the must-haves in terms of helping us establish this good gut-brain axis? One is timing of food. Uh, I think our body runs with a biological clock. The moment that is disrupted, everything goes for a toss. So I think the first key important, whether you take strains which are uh, you know, made uh, by fermentation process or naturally produced fermented foods, the time that it hits your stomach is extremely critical for it to undergo the entire digestion process and hence establish the correct gut brain. Um, I would say the current, uh, the correct wiring between the gut and the brain. Uh, I, for me, that would be the most, most critical part. I'm sure that would have triggered some of you, like, you know, the kind of lifestyle we have these days. Is it, I mean, we eat our breakfast at about maybe 7, 7, 10 in the morning. I know Dr. Sujata leaves her office at 8 in the morning, must be reaching at around 9.30 or so, and get back to home at about 9.30. All of you must be experiencing this. Uh, it becomes really difficult. I'm sure everybody suffers from that. The cities like Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, it's very difficult to maintain that kind of balance, until unless, you know, uh, you have a very uh, tuned system. So, uh, Dr. Sujata, what is, now, we, we, we know that we can't, uh, we don't work, you know, we don't have a, a nine to five kind of a job, right? Sometimes we would leave at four in the morning, sometimes we go to bed at about 12 in the night, and we eat our dinner at 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Very difficult to modulate our system. So what do you think uh, we should be doing in science to create a gut microbiome which adjusts to the conditions that, that are actually very taxing, but somehow gives us some relief. <laughs> That's a good dream. <laughs> All right. You got to dream to. I know, absolutely, something. absolutely. So this is like a time agnostic uh, gut, right? The, uh, see, what, uh, the, wh what are the, the, the scientific uh, learnings now that probably will enable? One is, of course, uh, the, the balance of good and bad uh, microbiota in the gut. I think the more and more the dysbiosis is a condition where you have more of the bad bacteria. If we are, if we are able to maintain that uh, balance of good and bad uh, uh, bacteria in the gut, I think that is going to immensely help um, in having a, uh, a gut that is more tolerant to the uh, that, uh, tortures <laughs> it undergoes, if I may say. Um, the uh, and also if you if you if you all of you might be, might have experienced when uh, when when it is when the uh, when, if you are not able to maintain time what happens uh, it's proven within a 21 days is good enough uh, if you are on a bad diet if 21 days is good enough where the microbiome 
uh, can completely change in the gut. So when uh, the my inputs to us when we are we cannot have a very controlled kind of timings for food. Uh, when you know that you are a little off track, then it's important that keep track of that and at least have some detoxing measures during your weekend so that you are able to get back uh, the, the balance. And this might not be very different than what our grandmas would have said. We have a routine of, uh, this is how I have grown up, and I'm sure all of you can relate to, we are forced to have a, 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 a detox routine. Uh, at least the castor oil, none of us would have loved. It is given along with milk, and you are supposed to actually cleanse uh, your gut. For me, if I think back, at that time I hated it, but now if I, if I think back, probably some of those good practices is what helping us to have a good uh, immunity when, when we grow up. Do we do that for the kids? Now, sciences know these are good practices which are natural detox, which helps us in actually getting back the, the balance of good and bad, bad bacteria in the gut. Uh, I think that is what I would recommend, following a detox routine. Uh, and I have followed it, and, and that super helps, and that's what I continue to do because it's a, with the kind of traffic system we have and the kind of uh, w w works all of us are having, it's impossible to have a clock precision unless you really carry food all the time with you, which we have products. I think I also recommend that. Keep always food in your car uh, so that you are stuck in a traffic, you are able to add something and have it. Uh, there are many, many... So many value proportions. Stick on for the startups, always stick on to the value that what you're going to deliver to the consumers. If they believe in you in that part, I'm absolutely sure every single brand, don't focus on launching 40, 50 products. One product and you have one purpose and the vision is clear and then consumers will definitely will go back. Because like I said, even snacks for indulgence or uh, the purpose, that very purpose is indulgence. Even now it's looked at as how we can go ahead and uh, go with the indulgence with health. Everywhere like health is taking priority than anything else. So that is something very important. And affordability, of course, like for consumers to afford. I'm pretty sure that even when now we are talking about sustainability, recyclability, every company, every corporate is looking at that. And again, even there, like you'll be very much uh, looking at like, I want to deliver a value to people. Stick on to the value. I'm pretty sure like every single startup would definitely go on. And that is what that every company wants to do. Great. Thank you. So I think it is like we are what we eat. Are we? Yep. So eat in moderation, have your biological clock ticking, do eat fermented foods because they really help, do consume probiotics, but as a source of food, not for, uh, not in the candies and the chocolates or in the chips. Tomorrow somebody will come and say that I've encapsulated bacteria and I've you know, impregnated them into the lace chips also. So don't try those times, they may not really work out. So this is how I sum up this session by saying thank you very much. It was a very absorbing session. Thanks to the esteemed panelists we had. We had some very intense deliberations, and very lively and very practical de uh, deliberations. So I'm open for uh, two or three questions if we have. We have about 10 minutes to go in case if there are any questions. Or any suggestions for any of us? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, you can have the mic. Anybody can help him provide mic, please. Uh, so, sir, actually, I have uh, three questions, if it is fine. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so, first question is to Dr. Shampa, ma'am. Um, as we were talking about the uh, precision fermentation, traditionally, we have been doing it for enzymes, like rennet, and uh, the scale at which we are doing it is quite small. If we compare it to the scale that, uh, that we will be needing it for uh, feeding people, uh, let's say protein, if we want protein from, uh, from uh, precision fermentation, I feel the scale that will be required uh, will be too large uh, for economical feasibility. Even now, if we see the economical feasibility of uh, fermentation, uh, precision fermentation proteins has, is very low. So what do you see? Uh, where is the future of this for you? Uh, see, future for uh, precision technologies are actually high. So ma'am has told about that. But now the challenge is how to expand, how to scale up this thing. Um, answers are there, you will have to find your way on your own. Uh, paths are there, 
answers are there but you will have to find it out for your don't leave it if you have started something don't leave it even i have done in the same way and all the startups those are successful they face similar challenges that i have uh, today said but you will find that lots of startups are doing very well they are unicorns now and they are actually doing well so future is there for precision technology everyone knows that uh, future is there but you will have to find out your ways and you have guidance you are sitting at niftum so you have big guidance also <laughs> so definitely <laughs> you will get answer uh, second question is to uh, dr priya ma'am uh, as you uh, were mentioning and discuss about the chassis for working mothers uh, like the de detox chassis so i read a research which was i think a western research uh, it, and it mentioned that for a resilient um, uh, uh, this thing digestive tract uh, you need a diverse microbiota in your stomach and your small intestine for that matter uh, but as far as i see for example if we take yakult uh, it only has one strain so uh, are we able to create the same amount of diversity using the sachets that uh, are used for detox first of all so we are not dependent on one particular strain like you rightly said we also consume other foods so your microbiota or the strains which are offered with a health benefit is always the predominant strain. That doesn't mean the other microorganisms, other strains are not produced in the stomach. So they are produced with, with respect to the other foods that you eat. You don't depend on one sachet to only do all the strains, right? So it is only the predominant strain with proven health benefits that comes with uh, that clinical backing to be able to establish the uh, benefit space. But otherwise, you are eating normal food, you are eating your uh, regular foods, which will also help build the microbiota. You are eating fibers. Uh, for example, your raw bananas, the kacha kela, which is used in Gujarat and South, is a very good prebiotic. Banana is a prebiotic. So these are natural prebiotics, which you are also taking on your day-to-day -day basis. Uh, if we talk about being in Delhi or metropolitan cities, it becomes quite a hassle for uh, people that are working uh, to consume such things. So, so your normal food gives, builds your microbiota in certain ways. You do, con you do consume lassi in the north, right? It's not that you don't consume any probiotic at all. Uh, sir was saying idli dosas are also available. So it, you are getting some amount of your gut microflora is building with the normal food also that you eat. These are just additional strains which are superior and can give you more benefit. So you are consuming fibers every day in your diet, right? You are consuming fruits, vegetables, cereals, millets, all these you are getting some amount of fibers. So that also alters your gut microbiota to a certain level. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, my third question is for Dr. Sujata, ma'am. Uh, so, as we all know, uh, in Ayurveda it is said that we should not eat yogurt or curd at night. Uh, but if we see that because of the lactic acid, the conformation of proteins is opened and the digestibility of proteins is uh, increased. So, uh, is it like the, how far is the claim valid? So, <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting, but before I, uh, I answer this question, I would like to add one thing on the biodiversity. So uh, I think consuming rainbow diet is primarily helps in increasing diversity of microbiota in the gut. So just to ensure that you have uh, food of all sources, like it's not only rich in rice, eat vegetables, that's why people say it has to be a balanced diet. Now coming to the, the Ayurveda question. Of course, we spoke a lot about uh, South. In South, uh, you eat curd all three meals. I think I have never had any dinner without eating curd, and that has worked for me. <laughs> okay, so now, why does Ayurveda say? If you now take Ayurveda, Ayurveda doesn't classify, don't eat that as a blanket statement. It is based on uh, your, uh, what is your vada, uh, 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 so, the, uh, what, what do we call it? Uh, yeah, so what, what's your status? So, it's primarily, if, you, if you're already having the, the 
uh, we call it pittam, right? You are already having a state where you are acidic. Then trying to add not just, it's not specified as only curd, curd which is fermented for too long, where the acidic content is very high and also it's too sour. So consuming curd which is too sour, especially with the vata kind of a uh, your, your, uh, body status, that is not good. Then it increases your acidity. So I think the details are in, in little going a few steps down about uh, this recommendation is under what condition. So that is about nutrition and diet recommendations, right? There is nothing called a blanket statement. That is where the science is evolving, where it is also about personalized nutrition. Because we can, we can recommend, give diet recommendations for an average. But uh, there is, uh, at the end, where it does it uh, for some specific conditions, will it really apply or not, can only come from after you take uh, listen to your stomach. That is also something I would like to tell. It's eat right and also listen to your stomach. If it doesn't work for you, it will give you a signal. Then you should stop and change it. But it's not a blanket statement. It is for a specific condition uh, and eating to when you're already having acidic state, uh, then having a very sour uh, kind of a, 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 a food, uh, uh, if it is then dahi, then that's not good. And also if we are eating very late, already you are acidic, then eating very acidic food will actually impair digestion. So it's all related to, can you digest it? Thank you so much, ma'am. I think, I think pretty well said, listen to your stomach. But what we do is we listen to our tongue. <laughs> we eat that? with our eyes and listen yeah, to the tongue. Listen to the tongue. Most That's of them are actually a slaves of tongue, I would say. So they, because that is the one that causes us everything, all the issues. True. Any other questions, any other inputs, additions? Uh, oh, yeah, please. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in Ayurveda, it's matra, that is the quantity, is also very important to mitigate the dosa or vata. Oh. That is the only Thank one you. input I want to add. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, yeah, he yeah. Has a I completely, doshas, right? That's yeah. the word I was looking Dosha, for. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> So warm greetings to the members of the panel. So my question is related uh, uh, to the vegan meats that are available in the market right now. So they have been making strides in the market, especially as an alternative for people who have been uh, uh, shifting from the meat-based diet to a uh, uh, vegetarian alternative diet uh, for reasons like sustainability and related. But the main concern or criticism they usually give towards these products, like uh, if we take a beef, Wagyu and Kobe beef, for example, they're world renowned for their meat dis uh, fat dispersion between the protein muscles. And when you cook them and eat them, the gush of juices that you get when you bite at them, it is unmatchable. So how can vegan meat replicate it? Because that's the uh, one thing that uh, vegan alternatives still lack. And my second question is that uh, uh, the majority of the uh, dried probiotic mix mixes that are available in the market, they usually have the issue of not dispersing efficiently in the water. If you see that they are not able to break through the surface tension of the water, that's why they remain up on the surface only. These are my questions. Okay. I think I'll take this question with your permission. Yeah, the first thing you talked about is why should we call a plant-based product a meat? So the vegetarians are the ones who believe in the vegan culture. Why should they be asked to eat meat? They have never tasted meat. They don't know how meat looks like, how meat smells. What is the texture of the meat? What is the aroma of the meat? What are the kind of flavors that you get in the meat? So I think this is uh, uh, somehow like I'm personally not very convinced to call it a plant-based meat. Plant-based products is fine. Soya chap is fine. You will, so if you're trying to say that, you know, you can do, it could be better for the, the non-vegetarians. You bring them to the vegan culture through this, saying that, okay, this is, this is quite similar in taste, aroma, texture, flavor compared to the meats. So you talked about how to make those plant meats or the plant uh, products more palatable and nutritious. I think the whole science lies behind it. So there are companies, there are startups also, and you know, Niftam also is working on how to make such kind of products more palatable. And there are ways to do that. And you don't have to really imitate everything. We should not become copycats. Like, you know, 
when, when the person doesn't want to eat meat, why to make him eat meat? What is more important is the palatability of the product, the texture of the product, the nutritional content of the product, its digestibility. Right? So your second question was on the encapsulation part. I think what really matters is the matrix with which you're encapsulating and the kind of emulsion you have made. I have seen if you put this Econom sachet in water, it disperses within uh, five seconds or 10 seconds. And the Delponom that you get, I don't remember the name of the company which supplies that, it has the cells, even the, the liquid suspension. So basically the matrix that you're working on is very, very important. And how you coat your cells. So the entire process has to be optimized. And we have also seen that, you know, uh, even in Niftum, the, the sachet that we have taken up, if you, you just add it even to the fruit juice, even if it is a cold fruit juice, or the, the juice taken up in the refrigerator, it disperses in, within, within no time, right? So little process modification helps you with that. So I think thank you very much, uh, my, all the audience, for, uh, patient, uh, for patiently listening to us. And that too, post lunch, 4 o'clock, <laughs> sitting without a cup of coffee, admire you all. And thank you all the esteemed panelists for your time. I'm sure that you all enjoyed uh, as, we, as much as we enjoyed you know, working, moderating this session and uh, deliberating this session. So thank you very much.